no the moon doesn't really go around the earth and in this video i'm gonna talk about that and why school sometimes teaches the wrong thing and why i think sometimes that's the right way to go without further ado let's begin hi my name is pranav and you're watching sciences joke to answer this question let's look at the dwarf planet pluto and its moon sharon Sharon is nearly one eighth the mass of Pluto, a mass ratio that's not found anywhere else in the solar system. Sharon is so massive that instead of orbiting its parent like we would expect, Sharon and Pluto both orbit a common point between them. Because of this, instead of being called the moon of Pluto, Sharon and Pluto are together called a twin system. This is the exact same thing. I'm sure you've seen it in any video or GIF that talks about uh, gravitational waves. The way two neutron stars or black holes revolve around each other is exactly the same. Any gravitationally bound system revolves around its center of mass, a point known as the barycenter. Since this point is dependent on where the bodies are in the system and how massive they are, it can lie anywhere on the line joining the centers of the two bodies. But it's always closer to the more massive one. Now do you get the way the Earth-Moon system works? If not, keep watching. This is the Earth and the Moon. The Earth is 81 times more massive than the Moon, which means their barycenter should be 81 times closer to the Earth than the Moon. I did the calculations, that's about 4680 kilometers from the center of the Earth. And you know what Earth's radius is? It's 6400 kilometers. That means the barycenter of the system lies so close to Earth that it's actually inside the Earth. And that results in this. Just like the moon has an orbit around the barycenter, the Earth also has an orbit around the same point. Note that this is exactly like the pluto sharon system. The only difference is that one of the bodies is so large that the barycenter actually lies inside it. Also note that the Earth has to always be on the opposite side of the moon in its orbit. Because the barycenter is the system's center of mass, meaning it has to always lie on the line joining the two bodies between the two bodies. Meaning whatever time the moon takes to go around its orbit, the Earth also takes the exact same time to go around its orbit. So given all this, you could ask, isn't it more accurate to say that the Earth and the Moon go around each other? Like two kids holding hands and going around in circles, but one of the kids is so big that uh, he goes in a smaller circle and the other kid goes in a bigger circle. Or let's be more precise, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that the Earth and the Moon go around the same point rather than just the Moon goes around the Earth? Now you could ask me, Prano, aren't you being a little, uh, what's the word, pedantic? The Earth's orbit is inside that of the Moon, so technically the Moon is going around the Earth, right? Oh no, you do not want to make that argument and here's why. The Earth and the Moon is a two-body system. But what if the Earth had two moons? Would we still have a barycenter? Yes, we would. It'll be the center mass of all three bodies and they will all orbit this barycenter. What if there were many bodies in the system, like Jupiter and all its moons? Yep, they all have a barycenter. And Jupiter orbits this barycenter. What about the solar system? Yep, it has a barycenter. And the sun also orbits this point. In fact, when all the giant planets are on the same side of the sun, uh, the barycenter actually lies outside the sun. How cool is all this? It doesn't end there because by the end of this video, I'll show how we use this information to discover planets outside the solar system. So to answer my earlier question, why can't you say that the moon goes around the earth? Look at these two statements. If we consider a system and its barycenter, these two statements are exactly alike. Both the bodies are part of the same system and the orbit of the second one lies inside that of the first one. But if you won't say the second statement, then you probably shouldn't say the first statement. What you should say is that the Earth and the Moon go around a common point, or that the Earth and Mercury go around a common point. Okay, fine, maybe I'm being a little too pedantic. Maybe for normal conversations about the Moon, it's fine to say that the Moon goes around the Earth. For normal conversations about planets, it's fine to say they go around the Sun. Okay, so why am I talking about this? Two reasons, let's see what they are. I've been in the education space for about seven years now and if there's one thing I've learned, it's how much are you getting a person to think while you're teaching them? It's called cognitive load. You have to give 
the learner some cognitive load only then they learn but too much and they just find it too difficult and they'll give up trying to understand it the same way too little cognitive load is also a bad thing the learner might find the topic too easy and therefore too boring and they'd rather turn their attention elsewhere i'm acutely aware of this when i write scripts at every point in the video i have to make sure that the cognitive load is in just the right place so that the viewer doesn't find the video too difficult or too easy and therefore too boring and in either of those situations they just end up clicking away and when a video loses retention that's a bad video according to the algorithm now how does this idea about cognitive load come into play with the moon's orbit it's lower cognitive load to say the first statement and higher cognitive load to say the second so depending upon the context of how you're saying it and how much cognitive load you want in that statement you may pick one or the other the second statement is more accurate but the first statement is more easier and therefore more understandable this idea of sacrificing accuracy for understandability is the reason you teach newton's laws in schools instead of einstein's relativity it's the reason you begin teaching speed as just distance by time when the learner is in the fifth grade but by the 11th grade you teach the same thing using differential calculus i'm sure you can think of relevant examples of this now on to the second reason why I, i'm talking about the barry center Let's say the sun's battery center is right here. The sun and the whole solar system will go around this point, right? Now let's turn the whole thing on its side and remove all the planets. Doesn't it look like the sun kind of wobbles? So if there are planets in orbit around a star, it sort of wobbles. This is the exact thing that astronomers look for when they're searching for an exoplanet or a planet outside the solar system, a planet not going around the sun. Whether its parent star wobbles. They can almost never see the planet itself because planets don't give off light and uh, there's not nearly enough light reflecting off of them to be seen by us, you, even using the most powerful telescopes. So instead, they look for things like how much a star wobbles or the change in brightness of that star like a planet just passed in front of it or the spectrum of light coming from that star and other methods that helps them figure out the nature of extra planets in that system like their size their distance from the planet star their mass etc how cool is all this so using this method of inferring from the wobble of a star on october 6th 1995 the first discovery of an exoplanet was made around a star 50 light years from earth if you like my work, support me on Patreon or buy me a coffee. If you like this video, then you might also find this video interesting where I've talked about the event that transformed classical physics into modern physics. I'll see you in the next one. Till then, remember, science is dope.